I'm going to speak to you this morning on the subject, bold leaders. Bold leaders. We've been looking at the story of Caleb. Coming around Caleb and just checking out his life. And as I say often, the thing I love about Caleb is that he wasn't Joshua and he wasn't Moses. Moses, an amazing leader. Probably one of the greats in the Old Testament. Joshua, an incredible young leader who took Israel into the promise. Caleb, well, we don't know whether he was a leader. What we do know is that he was a very faithful follower. What we do know is that he wasn't intimidated by his mate that got called to be the senior pastor. He just continued to stay true to what God had promised him. So we're going to come around the story of Caleb again this morning and pull some principles from his life. I'm going to share with you seven things about bold leaders. And hopefully one of them will bring challenge to you. Maybe all seven of them may bring challenge to you. But here's the thing. Wherever there's challenge, there's growth. Amen? And so let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you. Lord, for the honor it is always to come around your word. Father, I pray that today, looking at the life of Caleb, that, Lord, we be encouraged by it, full of faith as a result of it. And, Father, that we learn principles from his life that we can apply to our own life when it comes to extending the kingdom of God here on earth. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing in and through each and every life in Jesus' mighty name. Today we are talking to not only the Hills campus, but also talking to Phoenix. Yes. Amen. Which is now, which has now been birthed. I, uh, last Sunday night, we, uh, we launched Hillsong Phoenix and I called my wife. I said, we have now birthed another campus in the U.S. And uh, I said to her, now I know how it feels to give birth. And she said to me, Lee, you don't have a clue. <laughs> though, well, metaphorically, give or take. So speaking to Phoenix, also speaking to Brisbane, also speaking to Melbourne, and also speaking to Kiev. Amen. Bold leaders, bold leaders. It was incredible last week being in Phoenix and just having the student body there, you know, kind of like many of you at your first orientation come in like, what is this place? Why are people so nice? Why are people so encouraging? And I sat there and I talked to so many of the students and many of them come up and thanked me after the second day of classes. They come up and thanked me and said, man, like you guys are so encouraging. I can't believe that you believe in people so much. I've never been in an environment like this before. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, may that never be said again of the church. May the church always realize, I mean, these are students coming from churches, never being in an environment where they're believed in and imparted into. I thought to myself, man, we've got to play our part. We've got to be bold as leaders to continue to build the churches where people can come in and go, what is this place? I don't get that out in the world. I don't see that out in the world. And I really felt like after coming back from Phoenix just to talk on this subject of bold leaders, that even if at the end of this message there's 10 of you that go, Go, right, I'm one of the ten. Then praise God for every one of you that make a decision to go, that's me. I'm going to be that person. Because I believe that the church should be different to the world. I believe that the church is the answer to the local community. I believe that the community should wander into the church and go, what is it about this place? Why are you so encouraging? <laughs> to which then we can tell them about Jesus and all that he's done in our lives. You see, the one thing that we're about at Hillsong College and the one thing we'll always be about at Hillsong College is making disciples. Jesus said, make disciples of all nations. Our goal is to make disciples that raise or create an environment where we raise, equip, anointed leaders, exactly, to build unbelievable ministries and churches that will salt the earth. And so our goal is to disciple, but not only to disciple, but then to have you then go on and make disciples. 
to not only be passive recipients, but also be active contributors in the body of Christ. And if we're going to be active contributors, we've got to go from what's the church doing for me to what can I do for the church? Or what can Hillsong College do for me to what can I do for Hillsong College? And sometimes it's just a mindset shift. But as soon as you make the mindset shift, all of a sudden you begin to see things from a whole different perspective. All of a sudden you go into the land and where everyone else sees giants, you see victory. Where everyone else gets intimidated, you get more courageous, more bold, more strengthened in the Lord. And I believe that when it comes to being bold leaders, that we've got to continue to go forward into all that God has for us. So go with me to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. And I'm going to read the whole passage in from verse 6 down, it says this, Now the men, the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and said to him, You know that the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my conviction. Can everyone underline that? brought him back a report according to my conviction. Now remember, his convictions lined up with what Moses had said, of which what the Lord had told Moses. So this wasn't just a, oh, this is my own personal conviction. This was a conviction that was aligned with his leader, that was aligned with the Lord. Brought him back a report according to my convictions. And my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Underline that. Followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. That's the first time he says it. So on that day Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever. Because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. There's the second time. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years. Since the time he said to Moses while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old, and I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am still as vigorous to go to battle now as I was then. Now give me the hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard them, that the Anakites were there, and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, just as he said. I will drive them out. Just as he said, look how he follows the Lord wholeheartedly. As the Lord says, so I say. As the Lord does, so will I do. Amen? And it said, then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephna, and gave him Hebron. Underline that word Hebron. As his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephna, the Kenizzite, ever since. Because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. There it is a third time. Hebron used to be called, gosh, Kareath Abba, after Abba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Then it says, then the land had rest from war. I love this passage of scripture because it says of Caleb three times that he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. The first time coming from him, the second time coming from his leader. What would your leader say about you? What would the Lord your God say about you? You see, when we come around this passage of scripture and look at Caleb, the thing I love about Caleb was... Remember back in chapter 13, when God said to him, go up, or be bold, and go up and bring back fruit. Told him to be bold, and go up and bring back fruit. And so he finally gets Hebron allotted to him now. Joshua's blessed him. Caleb, this land is yours. And we see in chapter 15, verse, uh, give or take, around verse 14, 
We see that there's three more battles that Caleb has to do. Now he's given the land, but there's still three more battles. He's now been given the land after 45 years. Imagine what you would say after 45 years to the people around you when the promise came your way. Would it be, oh, finally, finally, I was one of the good ones. I, I am the Caleb of Caleb and Joshua. I'm the good guy. I was overlooked. I had to walk with these people for 45 years. Oh, you don't know how hard it is. I had a dream, but the Lord took it from me. Has kept me 45 years. Oh, if only you people understood. This is not the leadership lesson that Caleb's giving right now. Caleb is giving the lesson of inspiration. 45 years I've waited to see this. There's three more battles. We will take them down. We will go after the promise. Come on, guys. Let's go. And the name gets changed from uh, after one of the great uh, Anakite leaders. The name gets changed from a personality to Hebron. Hebron means community. Hebron means alliance. Another scholar says Hebron means to team up. Notice Caleb, once he got the land, didn't, okay, now we're going to call this land Caleb the Great. Now we're going to call this land Caleb the Faithful. Now we're going to call this land Caleb the Hero. They get allotted the land and Caleb calls it, let's team up. You see, there's something about bold leaders that know they can't do it in and of themselves. There is something about bold leaders that know that it's not about them. It's about what the Lord is doing through them for the sake of others. When we are leaders that look at the lives of those around us and continue to go forward, then we don't get caught up on our own personality or our own gifting or our own regret or our own whatever. No, come on. We've been given the promise. Let's team up. Let's align. Let's go forward into all that God has for us. So seven things about bold leaders. Number one, tell the person next to you and tell them, get ready for this. Seven things about bold leaders. Number one, they are compelled by promise. They are compelled by promise. I love that Caleb gets there 45 years later and he says, I am as strong today as the day I received the promise. He was just as uh, ready to take the king. Give me this hill country. Finally, it's within my reach. Give it to me. Let's go after it. But Caleb, you've got another three battles. I don't care if there's another five. The promise is there. It's right before me. Let's go after it. What promise are you driven by? I'm driven by the promise that Jesus said, I will build my church. That's the one thing I know I'm called to do on this earth, to build the church. And I also know that I'm called to make disciples of all nations. We've got 61 nations in college this semester. In fact, I think I saw 63. There's a lot of nations called to make disciples. But discipleship is not passive recipient. Discipleship is, come on, now rise up and be bold leaders and make disciples yourself. Compelled by promise. What promise are you driven by? What promise do you find in the Bible that you're driven by? Because I can guarantee you, if you've not found a promise yet, there's one in there for you. And every morning you get up and you look at that promise and you go, this is what my life is about. It will have you walk out of your room with your shoulders back, your chest up, your head forward going, God, give me my mountain. Finally, finally, the promise is before me. Bold leaders are compelled by promise. Number two, bold leaders are consumed with vision. Consumed with vision. Now give me this hill country. I kind of wonder, how many people would wait around 45 years to see the promise? How many would give up after five years? When we look in the Bible and you see guys like David, who was anointed and some 13 years later was then enthroned, you realize that 
God doesn't do anything quick. Abraham's given the promise at 75, it's fulfilled 25 years later. But he still kept moving forward. Can I say this to younger generation? God's not in a hurry. God's not in a hurry to give you your mountain. But he is in a hurry to get you on the journey. Because he knows the journey of faithfully turning up every day. Faithfully doing your devotion, faithfully praying, faithfully thinking others. He knows that if you can do that every day, that he can move you into your promise because you're beginning to establish faithfulness. But so often we're consumed with regret rather than fulfilled with vision. Oh, I thought I was going to be the next Joshua, but pff, it wasn't me. I'm just Caleb. Oh, well, you know, I told Moses he was an unbelievable man of God. I even prophesied over him, laid hands on him one time, and he looked back at me and said, Caleb, you're an incredible leader, but he didn't choose me. He chose Joshua. Joshua, Joshua, Joshua. <laughs> I was one of the good ones. I come back and said, let's go do it. But no, I had to walk around with these miserable 45 years with Israel. I had to put up with their garbage when I was one of the good ones. He wasn't consumed with regret he wasn't consumed with the negative he was inspired by vision for the future the promise is right there let's go get it it doesn't matter whether they're giants whether they're not giants. who cares our God is bigger if he said we're able we are able consumed with vision number three Caleb was constrained by conviction he come back with a report that said we can do this the others come back with a report that said, it seems too big. And Caleb doesn't disagree with them. Caleb says, yes, it does look too big, but God said. And if God said it, it's going to come to, but this was his conviction. He was consumed by, con oh, sorry, he was uh, constrained by conviction. What does conviction do? It determines what you say yes to and what you say no to. Caleb didn't have to wait to get the title before he got the conviction. He already grew into that. Can I say this to you young men? Get conviction now while you're single. Because if you don't have it the day you get on the altar, you're going to have to start building it at some point. And you are better to build it this side of marriage than get into marriage and realize you need to build it. Amen. Be faithful to your wife now. Though you may not know who she is, be faithful to her now. And you will be a blessed man that when the day comes. Determines what you say yes to and what you say no to. Constrained by conviction. One way you can always determine where your conviction is, is by the offense you take. You've heard me say it a thousand times, offense is your greatest teacher. Offense is simply this, Caleb, here's the allotted land. Now you've got three more offenses to overcome before you see the fullness of the promise. Now we read the story and we go, oh, that's easy. Good on you, Caleb, you just go up three more wars, no problem at all. Can I say this? Your offense is your battle. And you only get stronger on the other side of it. I, I, I say this, that, that offense is like, like God putting his finger on your life and going, see this small area? It's got to get bigger. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. Like, I'm so offended. I just walked for 45 years. I thought you would pick me up and drop me in the promise. Why do I have to continue to do that? And then you found scriptures as to why you can sit on your couch and do nothing. Oh, the Bible says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And I've got strength to lay on the couch and do nothing. <laughs> just lay in your offense when really you just miss the opportunity to strengthen for the battle. Constrained by conviction. Number four. Is everyone good? 
Turn to the person next to you and say, that point was for you, definitely. <laughs> hey, come back. Come back, number four. Not only constrained by conviction, number four, content with their allotment. Content with their allotment. Be content with what the Lord's given you. You don't see Joshua going, oh, great. Oh, Caleb going, oh, great. I've got the south. Just the south. I was one of the two. Surely I deserve half. Joshua, you take half north, I'll take half south. No, he said he gets the south. He doesn't look to the west and say, what about those towns? He doesn't look to the east and go, what about those towns? He doesn't look to the north and go, what about those towns? He simply looks at what he's got and says, let's go. What's God put in your hands right now? Oh, he hasn't given me anything. I'm, I'm just in the children's ministry. Just? Just in the children's ministry? Are you kidding me? There's a Joshua and Caleb in the children's ministry right now. That if you begin to speak into that, you begin to grow that. What you do is you save the issues that youth pastors have to deal with than the next generation. Then you save the problem by the time they become adults. All because you were faithful in the children's ministry. The amount of times over the years students tell me I'm in children's ministry, but I'm not called to children's ministry. And I say to them, well, you're going to have them one day. <laughs> Practice on ours to get yours right. Be content with your allotment. So often our finances are out of order. I'm like, God, God, give me more money. Hey, if, if your finances are out of order with the small amount you've got, you add to that, you just add more chaos. Maybe God is doing you a favor by not bringing more until you can live within your means with what you have. So often we want more, more than our capacity for faithfulness can hold. And maybe God's just holding you back, making sure the internal is right before he launches you into the external. Content with their allotment. Number five, bold leaders communicate culture. Said it before in leadership class, vision is where we're going, culture is what's going to get us there. What do you like with your teams? When you come into a team, does your team hear culture? Do they hear the church that I now see, which is aligned to Pastor Brian and Bobby? Do, do they hear culture coming out of your mouth? Or do they hear, oh, well, we're just going to do this, and who knows what God's going to do? Who, or is it like our Walls team back in 2004? Father, we thank you for the honor it is to do what we do. No one's going to see anything that we do, but we know that as a result of moving these walls, that students are going to come in tomorrow, and cities will be changed. Churches will be changed. Nations will be changed. What do you bring to your team? Do you hook your team up to the bigger picture? Or do you keep your team small and heads down? Caleb got the land and said, let's go. I've been waiting 45 years for this. Number six, not only do bold leaders communicate culture, they confront mediocrity. He says, I am more vigorous today than the day I received the promise. More passionate today than the day I received the promise. Hillsong College, can I ask you this? Are you more passionate today than the day you come in as a first year student? Are you more passionate today than orientation? If not, it's probably not the college that's gone wrong. It's probably not your roommates that have gone wrong. It's something in you that you need to confront, that you need to address, because it's gonna hold you back from the promise ahead of you. Bold leaders confront mediocrity. Oh, but it looks like a giant. God is the God who takes down giants. Let's go after all that he has for us. And number seven, bold leaders are consistently faithful. Scripture says in the message in Hebrews 13 verse 8, familiar passage of Scripture, but I like the message 
paraphrased version, because it says this, there should be a consistency that runs through us all as leaders. For Jesus was the same yesterday, today, and forever, totally himself. Can I say this? In leadership, you're going to have things, that opportunities to be up, opportunities to be down. But I honestly believe that as leaders, we have to be consistent. Do you allow the day to dictate to you how you're going to feel? Or do you wake up of a morning and tell the day how you're going to feel? Smith Wigglesworth, one of my heroes, he said, I wake up every morning and I never ask Wigglesworth how he feels. I look in the mirror and I tell him how he's going to feel. That's a man that dictates the day. He's never a passive recipient. He's always an active contributor. And I believe that if we're going to be bold leaders, Hillsong College, if we're going to go on and take the church into all that it's called to be, which many of you in this room, many of you in Brisbane and Melbourne and there in Kiev and over there in Phoenix, many of you are called to take the church in your area forward, the church in your city, church in your town, church in your nation, whatever it may look like. So many of us are called to take the church forward, to build ministries that are going to be a blessing to people. But if we're not bold... If we sit there, oh, when's it going to happen? Oh, God, you promised me. And God's sitting there saying, hey, get some tenacity. Get some courage. Get some boldness. See it before you and go after it. Then I believe then we'll see the church rise to be all that she's called to be, where the world comes in and goes, what is it about these people? Why are they so different? Why do they encourage me when the world discourages? Why do they put life in when the world tries to destroy? I believe that the church should be different on this earth. Amen? Amen. I'm going to have you all stand in this place this morning. Bold leaders, number one, are compelled by promise. Number two, consumed with vision. Number three, constrained by conviction. Number four, content with their allotment. Number five, communicate culture. Number six, uh, confront mediocrity. And number seven, are consistently faithful. Let's keep turning up. Let's make September the greatest month that you've ever had. Let's make September in church the greatest month for all the people that come in that don't know Jesus, that go, what is it about this place that's so different? Father, I thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness, and your blessing upon each and every life. Lord, I pray bring challenge where challenge is needed, conviction where conviction is needed. But Father, above all things, I pray it be said of us in the future that they were bold leaders that went forward and took the promise, laid hold of the promise, and saw the church rise to be all that she's called to be on the earth. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness, your blessing upon each and every life in Jesus' mighty name and a faith-filled college said together, amen, amen, and amen. Amen.